Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the meeting of the Children, Education and Communities Policy and Scrutiny Committee. Uh, the date today is Tuesday, 7th of March, for those watching the live stream later on. Um, welcome to members of the committee and to those people who are going to speak to us on the reports that have been presented. Um, first of all, I shall move on to apologies. I have apologies from Councillor Hollier, Councillor Fitzpatrick, Councillor Baker may be joining us later. Um, Councillor Fisher has joined us as a substitute for Councillor Hollier, with Councillor Looker, substitute for Councillor Fitzpatrick. Thank you both for attending today. Um, can I go on to the minutes, therefore, of the 20th of February? Any points anyone wants to make on the minutes of that meeting? In terms of declarations of interest, anyone have a declaration of interest you wish to, to raise? Councillor Webb. No, no. no. I, thought you, I thought you were about to. No, okay. Just looking at you. Um, I have two to make. Uh, on item seven, I'm a trustee of York Museums Trust. And on item eight, I'm an observer at the meetings of the um, the Theatre Trust. Okay, moving on to public participation, item three. I, I understand we have Flick Williams to speak to us on item seven. Ms. Williams, are you there? Yes, good evening. Good evening. As usual, you have two minutes to speak to us. I'll give you a warning after two and a half minutes. Sorry, three minutes to speak to us, and I'll give you a warning after two and a half minutes. Start in your own time. I last visited your scrutiny committee in April of last year to highlight the lack of genuine inclusivity and commitment to accessibility of every kind in the cultural strategy being presented before you. My purpose of joining you again today is not dissimilar. I note the report from the York Museums Trust and refer specifically to the section on York Castle Museum. I see the museum now reports healthy visitor numbers of more than 80% of pre-COVID levels, and that this museum is the Trust's most popular family and visitor attraction. So in light of all that, I express my surprise at the fact that on reading the planning portal after the closure of the planning consultation period for the My Castle Gateway planning application, no objection was submitted by the Castle Museum or the Museum's Trust. I predict the My Castle Gateway plans will be detrimental to the museum's visitor numbers in the following ways. The proposed closure of Castle Car Park will prevent visitors with a disabled family member, disabled child, parent or older uh, member from parking sufficiently close to the attraction. Furthermore, the double yellow lines around the Eye of York that permit blue badge holders to park for up to three hours, which currently acts as an overspill when the car park is full, will also be lost by the new hostile vehicle mitigation barriers erected between the Crown Court and Clifford's Tower. Perhaps worst of all, the facility for taxes, friends or family to drop or collect disabled people literally outside the door of the attraction will also be lost. So why no objection? Disabled people make up more than a fifth of the population, quite aside from their non-disabled friends and family members who, been, who may be lost as visitors as a result. In such challenging economic times, surely every visitor through the door counts, do they not? Perhaps the answer to my question also lies in the report. The letter of credit extended to the trust by the council probably means a reluctance to upset the apple cart by challenging the stated plans of the local authority. Well, there is still time, despite the fact the decision was due to go before planning last July or August, for reasons we can only speculate about, that never happened. Furthermore, the levelling up funding to pay for the scheme was not secured. So despite a generally held assumption that this planning decision has been made, it has not. Legally, objections to a planning decision may be made right up until it is made. So if you are serious about retaining and increasing visitor numbers, perhaps now would be the time. 
thank you for the time. Um, I must uh, now depart and prepare for my interview with BBC um, uh, Radio 4 on behalf of Reverse the Ban. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you. Good evening. Thanks for your views. Right. Um, the next item on the agenda is the School Improvement Update, item 4. Um, Maxine Squire is going to present it with Derek Sutherland. Thank you both. Nice to see you. Thank you, Chair. Um, the, the report in front of you provides um, a summary of the school performance outcomes during the academic year 21-22, with a particular uh, emphasis on the outcomes of disadvantaged children. I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Derek, who is Head of School Effectiveness and Achievement, to draw out uh, the key points in the report. Thank you. Uh, my name is Derek Sutherland, and um, I'll just take you through some key things through here. Um, our, obviously, our ambition is to secure better outcomes for all um, children and young people. And here we have given you statistics on what they look like at the end of reception. That's the GLD, Good Level of Development, Key Stage 1, and for, including phonics, Key Stage 2 outcomes, and Key Stage 4 in general, there was a dip in uh, right across the country in results. Um, the, the, however, one area that didn't dip was key stage two reading, which actually improved. Um, in the vast majority of cases, our dip was less than the national dip. So there was an impact on COVID uh, on, on young people, children and young people, but not as severe as maybe nationally. And I think that was partly due to the way we kept the system together through the York Schools Academies Board and through regular head teacher meetings that uh, meant we could um, implement COVID recovery as well as during the pandemic, you know, implement the uh, restrictions. Um, we're, we're pleased with a particular focus uh, in early years and the outcomes there, um, particularly for disadvantage, which is narrowing the gap and very pleased as a piece of work for early talk for York, very much concentrated on speech and language and communication, which is seeing a, a positive impact. A real good uh, result of that is we're upscaling that across the city, particularly in identifying children and young people with speech and language. So in the early years, 83% 80, of our schools, 81% uh, sorry of our schools have actually uh, returned data on screening uh, every child so 80, that, that, so about 80 or percent of children have been screened um, to check for any unidentified speech and language needs. And then that toolkit provides resources uh, of what we need to do for children. So I'm, I'm pleased with the outcomes generally. It's hard to say how that would look um, compared to previous years because it's a new uh, early years framework that children have been assessed on. However, um, we we do compare very well nationally and being in the 12th percentile of schools. So if you take out out 100, it's like in the top 12 uh, percentage. Um, the gap um, is is narrowing there, but at key stage one, so in phonics, was the biggest dip we really had. So phonics is an issue for us and something that we need to Im um, improve. And we're working with the English Endeavour English Hub and targeting schools there, which I've, I've put in there. So that is an area that we do need to look at. Still didn't drop quite as much nationally, but obviously for us in comparative was our weakest performing area. End of key stage one, although we're above um, the national averages and we did actually rise 18 places in the percentile ranking, that wasn't quite replicated for disadvantaged pupils. So that's an area that we need to focus on. Key stage two, there were quite strong outcomes for us um, compared to nationally. We rose um, five places in reading, um, but we fell in math. So that's an area. However, we're still above the national average uh, there. Reading, writing, um, maths combined, we're higher than the national average by 1.5. However, disadvantaged pupils didn't do as well, and we're in the 94th 
percent, uh, percentile, which is very low. So that is an area of concern. Uh, say we, we've got, um, we're looking at the success of early years uh, for uh, early talk for York, but there's some strategies in there about speech and language that we can use those assessments going up into key stage one and key stage two. So it doesn't just stop in the early years. So we'll do some more work there. Uh, key stage four, we're strong, outcomes two. Um, oh, sorry, just want to say progress from key stage one, that's year two, to year six, key stage two, was very good and we're really pleased. That has been improving year on year. And the progress of disadvantage is improving, but there's, it's still below the national averages. Um, so there's there's some good areas to celebrate, but there's still a lot more work to do, okay. particularly for disadvantage. Key stage four, um, particularly um, for all pupils, very strong results coming out, but what for in some of them are a little bit inconsistent. So whilst our, um, our standards haven't fallen, we have fallen a little bit in the percentile rankings against other authorities. So that's something to investigate further. Um, so it's just a bit about inconsistent results there rather than poor results uh, there. Okay. Uh, I think I'll leave it to you to ask questions about that because I didn't want to actually go through the actual data with you because it's all there. So I'm sort of open to any questions that you might want to ask. Thank you, Derek. Maxine, anything you'd like to, to add to that? I think um, one of the things that we um, put a lot of emphasis on was the fact that we've had historically an embedded disadvantage gap in the city. And it was the reason why we looked at it in a different way, which was to begin at the earliest stages in a young person's life through the, the focus we've had on the early years and early talk for York. The data that's coming out of early talk for York is proving that that is actually the, the important way to sustainably close the gap and to ensure that those techniques, those strategies, which we've identified in the early years as being significant, are um, continued because the welcome toolkit can be used right up to, to secondary age. So we're wanting to ensure that, that all schools um, beyond the age of five, understand the importance of the welcome toolkit and the interventions that it provides and that they're in, that they just become embedded and part of the, the normal way of addressing um, intervention for children where there is an identified um, speech and lang language and communication need. And um, so really important learning that we've developed from, from the, the two years of early talk for York. Um, I think the, the pleasing thing is as well that um, it, it closed the gap during a pandemic. And, and that was um, really a, a very important piece of the, the proof of concept work that the, the project team who were leading on early talk for York wanted to show. Um, so in many ways now, we, we now feel we, we understand more about how we can sustainably um, work uh, to close that gap in schools for, for, the, for our disadvantaged cohorts. Just one thing I wanted to add to that is, I think what we're really learning from that is what we can scale up as a universal offer yeah. and what would, what would it look like in every school. And to that, that needs to be a targeted intervention where we need to go in a bit more deeper into a particular area where we support schools a little bit more with a targeted, where it's a bit more stuck, say, or they got more disadvantaged. Lovely. Thank you both. Um, since we have the um, responsible executive member present, Councillor Wall, do you want to add anything to uh, Derek and Maxine's words? Thank you. Um, this is um, something that's very dear to my own heart, and I remember corresponding with Maxine five years ago um, in the run-up to the development of Early Talk for York, um, I was concerned about how far behind uh, some young people were starting their education. So if you're four and you're two years behind, then that the, the knock-on effect throughout the rest of your education career is very difficult to catch up. So um, I'm heartened by the evidence base um, to this and also the flexibility uh, that individual schools have been able to tailor the work um, to how their 
physical layout works, how their staffing um, works, but also I think in response to their local communities. And I think this is a, a testimony to the um, awareness that what the situation before it was embedded and it, it needed a complete rethink. Uh, and, and this has, has taken place. Um, so I think that's um, looking forward to uh, seeing um, greater achievement across um, uh, and more schools that take up um, the early Turk for York and uh, recognizing that phonics doesn't always work for everybody. There's a, there's a, there's a body of, because uh, I'm old enough to remember flashcards and it was like very, <laughs> so having something that was a synthetic um, uh, phrase, I, I, I may have found quite challenging. So I can uh, appreciate that, Cheers. Thank you, Councillor Waller. Any questions from around the committee members? Councillor Looker. I said I wasn't going to say anything, but uh, I think if I caught Councillor Waller right, he was expressing some uh, philosophical issues around the obsession with phonics, which I'm sure he and I would share. Um, <clears throat> It's interesting, actually. Uh, I can't remember how I learned to read, but I do remember learning to read. Um, my children learned to read on the initial teaching alphabet, which was the current fad in the 1960s, 70s. Um, naturally, because they were good and clever, they learned to read. And I'm quite persuaded that if a child is reasonably OK, they'll learn to read whatever the method what worries me is the children that are struggling may need a variety of techniques. And I, th I think phonics, the trouble with phonics is it teaches you to read the word, but it doesn't necessarily teach you how to make sense of what you're reading. Now, are we able to address some of that? I know it's difficult with these days, but it does worry me in looking particularly at the, the early years and the year one. One of the things that we did um, a few years ago through our work on the reading project was really focus on reading for meaning and, and inference. And uh, those techniques are, are still being used in, in, in various schools. Um, I think it is the area, obviously, where very often uh, there is that that gap in terms of people being able to mechanically read, but but actually then not having those higher level skills in terms of of, of inference, um, and it's it's one of the areas that we are uh, constantly drawing down support from the English Hub um, uh, around that, but also um, thinking about as well. I think one of the the areas that increasingly schools are starting to look at is how you really encourage reading for pleasure. That's it, isn't and, it? and I know um, last year, for example, we had our first schools, uh, school citywide reading festival, which was really focused on that in developing that that reading for pleasure by helping children to see it wasn't just about reading for the purposes of, of, of learning, but actually it, it gave you something that enriched your life. And, and that's very much um, a message that we're wanting to continue. Because if you can start to see reading as something that um, it is, is an integral part of your the way that you spend your leisure time, it actually helps you to, to develop those higher level reading skills. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that um, one of our schools did last year as part of Reading Week was really share the, the vast variety of reading there is. So um, everybody was... Um, encouraged at All Saints to, and all members of the school community, including the teachers, to say what was their favourite book or thing that they read and why. And it, it brought a huge richness to, to the school in terms of the fact that it wasn't just all about reading the classics or reading books. It could be a comic, it could be whatever it was. And it, it really, um, our schools um, are really embracing the idea of how they celebrate reading and become reading schools. Follow that up, Chair, because I think you're right. One of the 
real importance is, is making sure schools have on tap a wide range of reading materials. And I'm sure, I mean, we've got the libraries coming in later. I'm sure this is something one ought to be able to explore with the libraries because not everybody wants to read the same book. And um, it is finding that richness and variety of reading materials that is so important and that schools sometimes struggle to, to provide because, um, well, it's all, not always easy to um, supply the, the range. And I think also it's creating the space um, to value reading as well within the school day. So it's not just that you're reading from the textbook. I've been in a number of schools in the last couple of weeks where children are being encouraged to find a time to, to bring their own book and do some reading. Uh, and that's both in primary and secondary. And it's it's really good to see that that um, schools are, are celebrating reading for its own sake, mm. rather than just uh, the mechanical thing of, you've got a textbook in front of you that you need to read. Come on, Thank a point you. about phonics, synthetic phonics. I think it captures probably about 80 odd percent of children quite naturally. Mm. And actually it is a good program, there's no doubt. And it will have impact over time. But there was a big change in the phonics. So it could be a reason why phonics went down because everyone had to move and choose a, uh, a phonics program. And some schools were ahead of the curve and that some were behind all sorts of things. But the other thing that uh, going on is phonics teaching in itself isn't going to solve everything. And so there's that universal thing that we need to do. And then it's a targeted interventions for those who doesn't come naturally to struggle. So what we do for them. So I think it's schools are getting much more adept at the targeted intervention now because they struggled. They just did the phonics and they were embedding that. And then they realized there need to be layers on top of that. Thank you. Councillor Webb. Thank you, Chair. Um, I mean, the idea of a, a, a reading festival, the idea of uh, reading for pleasure is, is, of course, hugely important. And I think that it's something that, uh, you know, whatever point of school you are, whatever point of life you are, if you can read, it gives you such a huge advantage over everybody else. But I suppose if we just talk a little bit about um, the children in poverty in the city, um, who, you know, their family lives might be quite chaotic, their parents working shifts, they haven't got time to get them to a reading festival or take them down the library. Um, you know, the bus has been cut so they can't get there, for example. There's all sorts of reasons why young people struggle to get into reading and don't really see the importance of it. And in some cases, this is, is passed down through generations because, you know, families haven't been reading. Um, how are we, you've mentioned, Derek, about targeted support for those children who find it harder to read, but actually how are we targeting those families who find it harder to read because they just don't have access to things? What, what are we doing around that? And while I've got my button pushed, um, on catch-up funding that you've mentioned post-COVID, what's, what's happening to that? catch up funding over time. Oh, sorry. A lot of schools and probably supported by their parent teacher associations, things like that, um, have done quite I've known quite a lot of schools do investment in books and in making sure that disadvantaged children have access to good quality material. And I think I think something was to happen right because actually disadvantage in reading progress was better than national disadvantage for the first time. Um, and there has, as you know, from the YSAB board, a big push on reading for pleasure and activities that we can do. And then we have this EEF model, education endowment, uh, education endowment fund model, which is that you know universal targeted and wider opportunities and also so that wider is there's a lot more immersion in those stories um so they'll act out play out those so they become more meaningful and understanding for children so that goes to your point about it might be all right what you know read learning to read but how 
what you're understanding about reading. So there's a lot more of that tied in. And I think schools have got a lot better at the links. But it is hard, you know, if you're in a household that doesn't have many books, we know that vocabulary difference makes a huge difference in outcomes. So one thing that schools are really doing is making sure that they teach vocabulary, but the meaning and understanding of that vocabulary and how you use it. And there's a lot more focus gone into vocabulary development. The second part was, I can't remember now. <laughs> Catch-up funding. Catch-up, yeah. All schools had to publish their catch-up funding, and we monitored that um, at the beginning. Uh, catch-up funding, we asked them to send them into us, or they sent them into their CEOs, you know, that's. so we have monitored that. And there's been a lot of talk about how to use it effectively, because you probably had the tutoring programme, which didn't particularly serve our children well, because the problem with the tutoring programme is they're delivered by adults who don't know the children, and actually having a good understanding of the knowledge of children and their barriers to learning. We found that it was better done by school-led tutoring. Uh, and what a lot of um, schools are doing now, which is quite different to the beginning of it, is they often use the funding not to pay directly for that tutor because the teacher delivers it, but it's the backfill. So actually we know that the best teachers ought to be doing the catch-up mm -hmm and not left to it, you know, somebody else to a teaching. So a lot of schools are really rethought about, and that's send as, send as well, children with send, is actually it's better being doing by your best staff teaching send, and that your teaching assistants, your support staff, actually work with the children, because they learn probably no matter how what the quality of teaching is there. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And I think that that is a, a really valuable use of, any funding to be honest that is available um and yeah the, the 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 thing in schools is always okay we'll go and do this extra thing but who's going to pay for the cover that's <laughs> that's what it is isn't it but my question was about what's going to happen to that catch-up yeah. funding over time well as as you know council web it will eventually disappear um because you know there's there's no longer term commitment to it um uh the DfE tell us that actually schools are funded more effectively than they've ever been at the moment. And obviously um, additional funding, we are told by central government, has been put directly into, into schools budgets over the, the last year. Um, does it totally compensate for all the, the forms of funding that were there previously? Um, no, you know, schools are, are finding it difficult because their costs are accelerating at a faster rate than, than the, the income that they gain. Um, what I would say on reading, though, as well, for those children who do live in our disadvantaged communities, I know a number of our schools that serve the most disadvantaged do gift books to families. Um, and, and certainly um, Clifton Green in, in the last year, the Christmas present from the school was a book for, for each child. So, um, you know, there, there are lots of those, those schemes that, that do take place. Um, and it is also, um, we know that York's got a really rich resource in its explores, but it's also trying to get our most disadvantaged communities really engaged with their explore and and use that free resource it's it's a fabulous repository of really really great stuff and it's just getting people comfortable to go in there you know um it's 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 making sure that every child in the city has got a library card and you know if that's almost given to them the minute they they're born or or the minute they they get into statutory school age it's it's a really really important thing but but then also ensuring that that they they actually visit and and get to to feel what it's like and not to feel uncomfortable in in those spaces and i know that's the ambition of the reach partnership you know that they're, they're really thinking that through thank you maxine councillor oral yeah. Uh, just to uh, echo what people have said about uh, fashions in teaching of reading, if you've been around long enough, you see it perhaps more than once uh, and different education ministers uh, make schools do things at times which aren't necessarily productive. Uh, but it was, we were talking earlier about uh, 
reading and comprehension. Uh, there's a, a two-stage process there in actually physically being able to, to read the words and then moving on to the comprehension of, of what they've read. Um, so we had to uh, test children to see progress and we moved from word recognition to comprehensive or comprehension tests at one point, which was a much more informative way of, of finding out how the children were progressing. Um, libraries, I think that's essential that we use the libraries that we've got. We're very lucky to have as many libraries as we have for children to go to. It's not always the case. Um, but the only question is, and it's just a, uh, a typo, I think, on number eight, it says, uh, trend data is not available until 2023. Now it must be some point in 2023. Yeah, it's due to the changes that happened in the EYFS framework. So we'll only have comparative data because you'll be measuring like with like this summer. Uh, so you've got two years data to have yeah. a look at this summer rather than the one year from uh, 2022. Okay. Councillor Fisher. Fisher. Um, do we have any data from which is uh, comparative? from the start of students entering education to them leaving, say, at the end of Key Stage 2, leaving primary at the end of Key Stage 2, and from the initiation of Key Stage 3 to Key Stage 4, or even Key Stage 5. Because I think in terms of absolute rankings, we've got all the data here as where we stand and how many students have achieved. But I've always found during my time in education that you look at value added, but it's a much more valued assessment how the students have progressed from the start of that particular Key Stage to the end. Do we have any data on that available? Yes, that's the progress um, indicators. Do you want to say? Yeah. yeah. It, it's changing slightly, but at the moment, we only have progress from end of key stage one, which is year two, to end of year six. And then we've got your progress eight, which is in secondary school, the progress mega secondary. They have changed the early years data baseline so that they'll give, that we will in future, but you can see that's going to take six, seven years, isn't it? to work through, but we will start having that data. So at the end of beginning of primary to end of primary, we don't have that yet. We just have end of key stage one to end of key stage two. And it's, it's obviously that we want to do in terms of a longitudinal study following the early talk for York children through. Thank you for that. I think that's very reassuring. Thank you. Any further questions? Does the wallet bit points you want to make? Um, thank you. I think just picking up on, on one of the points, um, I'm aware that there are more familiarisation trips from schools to libraries to get them over the threshold and, and familiar with um, going in. So I think it, it's, it's really making sure that uh, uh, that that work continues. Thank you. Uh, Derek, Maxine, thank you very much for your report and uh, see you again. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right, in that case, uh, we'll move on to item five, the 2022-23 third quarter financial performance monitoring report. Uh, Richard, it's, it's your turn for this one, I think. Thank you, Chair. Do you want me to briefly introduce? Yeah. If you would, thank yeah. you. Okay, so this is um, the third third monitoring report uh, that we brought to you this year. Um, I'll tell you the usual thing that I tell you every time that this is um, pulling on from the full council um, uh, quarter three monitoring report that went to the executive um, early in February, uh, picks up all of the budget areas and service plans that uh, relate to this committee. So the whole of the children education directorate is included in here and then the communities element of, of Custer and Communities Directorate. Um, in terms of the finance, um, we, I think at the end of at the last quarter's meeting, um, I did um, give a, a verbal message that we felt that the position was improving or would expect it to improve by the time we get to quarter three. And that has been the case. 
Uh, so uh, there's been an improvement of just over a million pounds, particularly in children in education, in terms of their projected outturn. So that's uh, a po positive, um, positive movement, um, particularly around um, the reduction in agency placements, which has come down, I think, by uh, about 50 percent since um, since the new management team um, were in place, and also um, concerted effort on um, looking at the high cost placements and reducing reducing some of those costs there. Um, with both of those two um, issues, because of the timing of when those savings have started to come through in the year, it's a modest impact on this year's projections, but we expect a much more significant impact for a full year when we move into 23-24. Uh, so I'll, I'll stop there and open it up for questions and, and comments. Thank you very much. Any questions, Randy? Councillor Webb. Thank you, Chair. So it can't all be that good, Richard. I mean, the executive members just run off. I don't know what's happened there, but there you go. Um, at paragraph 28 on page 21 of the report, uh, and Danielle, you might be able to, to sort of help answer this one as well. So the number of referrals to children's social care has been consistent with the last year. I was wondering, how is this... What's the trend over a longer period of time in terms of referrals? Is it is it... Is it going up? Is it going down? Because obviously we've had a massive spike in the number of children in care, haven't we? And, and, and we keep talking about the fact that that number is coming down. So in terms of referrals, we'd sort of expect that number to be coming down as well, um, resulting in fewer children going into care and things like that. You'd expect the numbers to at least have some correlation. Um, is that the case? Uh, what's it like over time? Um, okay, so the, the referrals into into our um, service have been um, consistent in comparison to last year and I believe um, previous years. Um, we know that other authorities are seeing a huge increase in the number of referrals that are, that are, that are coming that are coming through. What we would expect is to be working with more children within that earlier part of the service, early help, um, child in need, and then working to prevent. Um, children then from becoming looked after we wouldn't necessarily um, want to see less referrals coming in and less children becoming looked after we wouldn't want to be seeing that we're doing that work to give families the help and support that they need to prevent children then entering the care system and so on that ground then are the referrals on that and the work of early help is that going up I think we are seeing an increase in, in, in work that's happening externally um, around around early help. I still think there's a lot more that we that we need to that we need to be doing. Um, we need to be, you know, there's a plan to re-look at and relaunch our early help strategy, look at the support that we give further to our partners to enable um, people to feel more skilled up and to do better in, in, in feeling more confidence around delivering early help as a partnership. So while I think that they're there is um, a, a more happening. I still think there's more to do. Any other questions? That's where we get. Go on then, one last one for me. Um, in the, um, the indicators, I um, don't know how to describe, page 26 of the report, about halfway down, there's one uh, percentage of children in care having three or more moves in the last 12 months. Um, could you just talk us through, because obviously that's got a little bit worse. Um, what's what's going on there? So obviously that, that does seem, doesn't seem great, does it? Uh, to have uh, three or more moves in the last 12 months. So I was wondering if you could just talk to that. Our placement stability um, overall for the city is good in comparison to to other to other um, areas. We have had, um, as you know, we're looking very closely at our cohort of, of of children, young people who are in the care in the care system, ensuring that we're progressing their plans in a more timely more timely way. So, um, if I can just talk from recently, we've seen more children um returning into their into their families it does create a move for young people but overall our placement stability is good good thank you very much Mr. Heaton. <clears throat> thanks yeah just a very quick one looking at um the out of our city placements um obviously that's a 
a major factor when we're looking at overspend. Do we have any sort of information on how many of those are because we lack capacity? And then how many of them might be due to, you know, that is the family situation? We are currently doing a piece of work to, to, to look at that around the out-of-city placements, how many children, you know, we will have children who are placed out of the area who are placed with their family, and it's right for them to be out, out of the area. Um, however, we also know um, that we do place children out of their out of the area because of because of um, need capacity to meet um, their need. There is a um, national issue around um, around placements, which does at time mean that we have to place children outside of the outside of the area. Thank you, Danielle. Any other questions around the table? That case, thank you, Richard. Thank you, Danielle, for your report. Right. Uh, in that case, I'll move on to item six, the reach update, uh, with Chris Edwards. Hello, Chris. Nice to see you again. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, it's, it's, it's a little while. I'm here to talk about REACH. REACH is the lead partner charged with overseeing the delivery of the children's and young people's elements of York's creative future. And the reason why I'm involved, partly Maxine's fault, partly the Arts Council's fault, but we know from the body of research we have the difference the arts, culture and creativity make to children's lives. It changes lives. It is one of the most powerful influences on any child and probably particularly the most vulnerable children. I mean, along with a commitment to the early years, I think the other piece of the jigsaw puzzle that we're trying to develop is that outstanding creative cultural and arts offer. And what we've said in York's culture strategy is that every child should have an entitlement to those things. Every child should sing, dance, act, make music, perform, design and create. And we know that the children who do that do better in English and maths. They do better in terms of job opportunities. They stay longer. They stay out of the prison system. The more you can give children and young people those things, the, the more of a difference we can make. And we have about 60 partners now who have committed themselves to that series of promises and what we're trying to do then, um, and fortunately supported by the City of York Council and the Arts Council, is put in place an infrastructure that means that it happens because progressively over the last 10 years, music, the arts, culture and creativity have been forced backwards in terms of the curriculum offer. What we want to do is put it back. And... Um, that I think is the challenge for us. And I've been doing this now for four years and what we have achieved so far, we've done bags of creativity. We gave a thousand of the most vulnerable young people in the, in the city, a bag of stuff, postcards of activities, paper, pens, cards, scissors. And we dropped those into families we knew didn't have that stuff. And the big moan we got was, why didn't we give every child in the city a bag? Well, I agree with that, but actually money doesn't come on trees. We then worked with the University of York on their Festival of Ideas and said, OK, if the Festival of Ideas does all this great stuff, how do you reach children and how do you reach the most vulnerable families? Let's take a bag of creativity. So you're doing a talk on, um, I don't know, bubbles. In the bag went a postcard, a pot of bubbles, and we then created a little video which went online with a child doing the activity. And that was a further development of the um, bags of creativity. And we distributed 2,000, working closely with Maxi, to every child in a primary school on free school meals. All of the children on free school meals in primary schools got a bag, festival of ideas, um, again, with stuff and fun. And we also worked with York St. John University and produced the Reach Doodle Box, which was 
But how do you get young people to understand that, you know, great artists, what they do is they have a, a sketchbook, they have a notebook and they scribble ideas. How can we get children? So we gave a thousand primary children, a thousand secondary children, a doodle book for them and with prompts and ideas all the way through, you know, what, what do you want your neighborhood to look like? What do you want your school to look like? What do you want York to look like? And getting young people, getting the voice of young people into this system. We then worked with UNESCO and the, we, are, we are one of the UNESCO cities. We're the only UK um, UNESCO city of digital arts. And we worked with Viborg in Denmark and their great idea was during the pandemic, how could we send messages of hope to the children of the world? So we selected, we worked with four of our primary schools and we asked the children to come up with pictures we could send to the children of the world with opportunities and hope. And we sent them to Denmark and they were displayed on the side of the National Art Gallery in Copenhagen. Some of them were animated and they created from the children's little drawing an animated story. And it, it was just fantastic. And to be able to say to a child, and BBC Look North got involved, and to be able to say to a child, your piece of art actually ended up on the side of the art gallery in Copenhagen and actually went to China. Um, we did a little bit here, but not quite as much. We've also produced the 50 creative and fun things to do before you're 12 in York. And again, trying to get people to understand the joy there is. I mean, listening to um, Max and Derek talk about phonics and um, number, There's not a lot of joy in phonics and number, but you watch a child dance. You watch a child sing and the magic there is going to the festival, the dance festival recently, going to the, you know, all sorts of things where you see that magic coming out, watching very small children dance and the joy on their faces. And the interesting thing that the research we've looked at says those sorts of things encourage, if you can then encourage the children to do some writing, some drawing as a result of their dance or their music or whatever, that's how you hook young people into what we're trying to do. For the first three years of my work with um, Reach, we weren't given any money. We weren't given any money because basically we were told York has it all. There are, there are not any problems in York. York's, you know, um, I remember when I started the, um, when I was part of the team that set up York Education Department, um, we were told by North Yorkshire, we would never be as good as North Yorkshire. And of course we're better than North Yorkshire. Um, and, you know, that thing, there's this perception that we've got the Museums Trust, we've got early music, we've got the National Railway Museum, we've got it all. You know, 3,000 children on free school meals, 40% of children don't have a book at home. And OK, it's great because last week, you'll know, was World Book Day. Every child got a book. Every child through their school got a book. But that's only one book. How you know, Maxine's right. One of the things we've said about um, how we move this forward, surely every child when they're born ought to get a pack from the city council, which contains a library card, a book, a set of golden tickets um, that say, come to all these wonderful things, they're yours. So I think we're beginning to develop that, but we're trying to put in place the infrastructure. And what your money has helped us do is we, are, we identified together 12 schools. Um, we haven't got all 12 schools signed up. We've got nine of the 12 schools signed up and you can't make the schools get involved, but we're still working with Vale of York, Cobmore Oaks Primary and Applefields to get them involved. But the other nine have signed up. And of course, the thing about York is another um, 11 approached us and said, we want some of this. So we actually have 20 schools in our project. It was supposed to be working with four, then 12. We've now got 20, which is half the primary schools in the city. Um, and what we're trying to do now is work we've got the schools lined up we've said to the schools they all have to identify a leader a senior member of staff who's passionate about the arts who will be the voice of the arts in the school we we're working with the partners and saying we want 20 of the partners to come up with um, some time to be a champion to work in 
the 20 schools to encourage them to think strategically about why it's important that the arts appears in the curriculum. Um, and we also want in every one of the 20 schools, a little group of children who talk about why those things are important. And we've just produced our first little video, which will be available soon on our website. And um, it's about art, why children love art. We're doing another one about music, we're doing another one about dance. Um, just so we've got something where the children tell us why these things are important. Um, we've also taken, well, I think one of the one of the frustrations in a, in a city with so much going on, we've got so many um, children and young people hubs, places on the website where the Children and Young Activity Act. We're trying to pull that all together. So we've got Make It York and Reach working together now on a common portal where all the organisations will put their stuff so that schools can, if they're looking for dance or they're looking for uh, music or they're looking for theatre, they can go on there. Because if you're a lucky kid, if you're a lucky child in this city with a lucky member of staff who really understands you're blessed, if you're not, you miss out. So how do we make sure that it's easy for schools and teachers to say, I need, I really could do with a dance thing this way, or I could do with an arts thing, or I could do with a project. So we're trying to do that through our work with Make It York, and we've invested some of our resource, some of the resource you gave us in doing that. What we hope is that every school in the city, once we get this going, will want to be part of the project. So um, we want every school to have a really magical offer to their children. Um, and I, I, I'm really encouraged because I think we're getting there. Um, and I, you know, the report tells us what we're doing. We're, we are, we're at the moment, I think the frustration with, with me, with the Arts Council, is they, comment, they constantly tell me I shouldn't be doing stuff. I should be strategic. And I've never been strategic. Janet knows I've never been strategic. Um, I, I think the way you get people interested involved is you do stuff. The reason people are interested in what we do because of the bags of creativity, because of the doodle books. So those are the things that hook people into getting involved. And our latest plan is we've got a, we're trying to put together a green project, which is going to be, um, we've got a young dancer who's, been working on a short dance presentation which is about saving the planet she is going to work in target primary schools with groups of children who are then going to draw pictures and come up with their ideas how do we save the planet we're going to send those to Denmark because the Denmark scheme this year is about saving the planet we've got arts award discovery the children will receive arts award discovery um, and what we also want to do, and we're trying to find some funding, is give every child in the schools involved a green bag of creativity full of ideas how we can green the city and how we can green the planet. Um, and the contents of the bag will come from the 20 schools and the children. So we're trying to put together a project. That's our next step. And hopefully um, that will happen during the summer. And that will be how we'll use your resource. That's great, Chris. Thank you very much for that uh, overview. Any questions from around the table? I can't, I can't resist this one. It's I, I hadn't, I must admit, having sort of been out of touch with the education side of things for rather a long time, I, I hadn't kept up to date with REACH, so this is lovely, um, because it's beginning to provide the answer to to that question um which we we raised um, councillor webb raised earlier is how you manage to enable children to access the wealth of stuff that is in the city and a lot of it is free um if you can sort of get to it or if you know about it or if you feel confident about it two particular things struck me when i was reading the report one is did you the bags of creativity are lovely. Did you get any, what were the responses from children as to what to do with what they did with them? Did they, did they really, did you have the data to sort of 
pick up what they were doing with their bags um, to make sure, you know, it was, didn't just go, I don't know where. The other thing I wanted to pick up on, though, was the 50 creative and fun things to do in York before you are 12. Um, there was a wonderful initiative being run by the National Trust a few years ago. Did you base it on that? It, on the idea. <laughs> every child should um, climb a tree before they're 12. Every child should have made a mud pie before they're 12. Um, I'm presuming these are the sorts of things you've got in there. Because, yeah. absolutely. Um, but I do, I do remember discussing at some point, I don't know quite where it got to, um, that this is the sort of thing, the libraries are very good at doing those um, challenges. And I thought, you know, you could do these challenges in the summer holidays, give every child a little challenge card and tick them off. Yes, I climbed a tree. Yes, I did this or did that. And it would be a, a change from reading a book, which is also important. But um... That last bit, some of the schools have taken the ideas and produced little documents with um, the, art, the, the items listed and you, the children tick it off. And it is do it during the school year and doing in the holidays and taking some home and doing so i think that has begun to happen and i think the libraries again we're, we're, we're trying to do some of those things um the the, the thing <laughs> i don't know how i mean i'm completely lost in terms of what your first question was now janet um tell me again what did you do with the bags of stuff? Oh, yeah. Well, the reason the, the reason when we talked to the university the second time with the bags of creativity was what we discovered was that some of them were slung in a corner. The, the ones which we gave to youth groups tended to work better because they were taught and they were there were more there was more structure. Um the ones that school, and again, the schools with more systems and structure tended to use them differently. But if you gave it into a into a home, there was a chance that it would just be thrown in the corner and nothing happened. So that was why in the second group, we, we produced more structure with the little videos of the activity. Um, and just to show the children what it was, what, what we were trying to do with bubbles, what we were trying to do with origami, what we were trying to do with some of the physics ideas that were involved. Um, so that was more structured. And I think the, the thing that every time we've done it, we've gone back to the schools and the providers who we've given them to and said, okay, what did we learn? And the feedback we've had has been great. The big, as I said, the big moan from schools is why didn't everybody get one? That's, that's the big moan every time. Um, you know, if this is important, we're, you know, we're busy, we've not got enough time to do this, we don't have the resources to do this, why can't we have one as well? And of course, being on free school meals, it, it, the, the earning level is so low anyway. I mean, we, we, we need to be thinking about that next cohort above the free school meals threshold. Um, but yeah, yeah, we're, we're, we're learning all the time. I think that's the important thing. It's like schools, you have to be good learners. Thank you, Chris. Any other questions on the committee? Councillor Oral. Yeah, just some comments. Chris, thank you very much. I found that quite inspiring, actually, what you're doing there. Uh, as someone who was told quite early that they couldn't sing and later that they couldn't draw, and certainly boys then didn't dance so we didn't have any of those those things then so uh you mentioned curriculum and and how it's been reduced on the national curriculum are you finding that what you're doing is sort of getting around that somehow and, and getting um this area into into schools in the curriculum um I think it's going to be a battle because you've got Ofsted hovering in the wings. You've got a DfE that really doesn't understand what we're talking about. Um, but I think the great thing is you've got mats and you've got head teachers and you've got teachers who do actually understand. Yeah. And we 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 now have so I mean one of the things I've said to the schools: stick the evidence base on the notice board in the staff room. Yeah. 
Um, you know, having read it, why wouldn't you put this in the curriculum? Um, and what we've said is, OK, I know some people tend to say it's marginal. You do it at the end of the day. You can have non-curriculum days, have days off curriculum where you can do some of the interesting stuff. How we connect with World Book Day, how we connect with some of the, the national days where children do different things. Um, I think, you know, the dance festival, the voice, there's a huge voice pro program that schools have got involved in. Um, they can they they can do this. What we've got to say to people, and I think what, you know, Maxine and the team will be saying to people, actually, it's legitimate. It's OK. It's OK to have spend a day singing. It's OK to spend a day dancing. It's OK to spend a day, you know making music there was a program on radio for today about how terrible it is that we've lost what janet and i worked really hard to put in place in terms of music services and arts services it's it's gone and what they were saying is what does that mean in 20 years time what's what's the landscape going to look like if we don't and you know it's that thing i think if every child sings, we will get the singers bubbling up, the brilliant singers, and you'll be surprised at how many brilliant singers. If every child plays music, you, we will get those people bubbling up to the top. And it ought to be an entitlement that you play. In. It's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. Um, and, you know... We've also talked a lot in the steering group about the link between um, the arts and culture and, and mental health and well-being. And, and obviously, you know, we've got a lot of children in the city who are really struggling um, with anxiety, uh, with the fact that they've had two years where they've, they've not been able to do some of those, those um, collaborative activities. And um, what all the research shows is that engaging with dance, drama, singing has a really positive impact on on your mental health and well-being so it's it's really it's trying to look at those benefits which are just beyond the fact that this is a a part of the school curriculum it's it's part of a whole school approach to well-being as well i think also there's another really important thing which is about I, some of the work i did i worked in sheffield for a while after i left um employment and we basically talked to Sheffield employers about what they were looking for, and they weren't looking for phonics and number. They were looking for teamwork. They were looking for listening skills. They were look looking for resilience. They were looking for that set of skills that lie at the heart of the arts. And, you know, that, that thing, that pipeline, if we're serious, we have a hugely um, valuable piece of, the, the, the world in, in the arts culture sector. You know, the film industry, the music industry is hugely important. And it's not just the performers, it's all the backup stuff. So we need a skills pipeline that actually starts children understanding what the jobs are that you can do if you go down this pathway. And actually, the pathway's fun. <laughs> Sorry, I know you're gonna... That's fine. Uh, Councillor Webb is next. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chris. And let's be honest, I think in the last, well, 13 years, um, I can't think why it might be 13 years, um, there's been an absolute decimation of public services for arts. Um, and it's it's very much becoming the, the, you know, the privilege of the very rich again, isn't it? And that's something that we desperately need to avoid. And everything you're doing here is having a huge uh, benefit. Um, and I think I sort of follow on from what Councillor Oral said, though, about um, how you get this embedded within schools. Because I think Maxine's hit on a, an important point about well-being in schools. And I think we need to rethink about what we class as the curriculum. The curriculum is more than just... Sorry for that absolutely inspiring report that we had earlier on where we had all the numbers, but um, it's more than item four um, and more than well, the progress we've made over time. But actually, how do we get round to the point that actually you will get better outcomes in 
your maths, your science, your English, your languages, your English baccalaureate, whatever that is. Um, I should know. And you will get those if you're willing to be confident as a, as a school and invest the time required in, in the arts, in creativity. Um, it's really hard to do because, as I'm speaking as a teacher myself, the pressure to focus on the very, very narrow curriculum that is laid down before us as it currently stands is ludicrous. And what we're asking for here is, 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 is bolt-ons, is add-ons. But actually, what are we doing to, to talk to schools and say, actually, no, if we embed this at the heart of our curriculum, it will then cause the benefits that we're actually talking about elsewhere. I think it is. It's it's building out from those schools that we know that are doing this. So, you know, we have got schools in the city that that do view things through that creativity lens and and they have developed um, it at the heart of their curriculum. Um, we had a, a primary school inspector not so long ago, which um, is integral to this this steering group where creativity is absolutely central to the way that they work and you know they were told at their next inspection they will be an outstanding school as a result of that so I think it's 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 showing that you can meet those accountability measures and um, that it can actually drive something very very special in your school um, there are some key individuals in schools in the city who are really driving those approaches um you know one of those does sit in archbishop holgates and and is, is is quite a leading musician in in the city and i think it is it's starting to recognize that they aren't add-on skills you know um really really good musicians are really good mathematicians and it's it's showing the way in which these these, these skill sets are really complementary. But, but I would say as well that it's also the fact that we've got to get back to the fact that we've got to get some joy back in learning. And uh, I think that's that's actually what's creating quite a national crisis at the moment around um, the, the tsunami of anxiety that we've got in our schools. It's because everybody's feeling that pressure from the, you know, sort of the head teacher down. Um, I know from my own teaching experience, you know, the thing I absolutely loved every year was being the stage manager for the, the school production. And, and, you know, I really looked forward to doing that. Um, and I know colleagues in schools at the moment are thinking, gosh, how do I get the time anymore to do those types of things? But they're, all, they're almost the most important things that you do because you get to see the children in a completely different way. And it's, it's, it's almost like um, saying, you know, sort of, can we as, as a, a city show the value of this? Because we have such a rich and vibrant cultural community in the city. You almost feel like if York can't do it, who can? But you also have to be brave. Yeah. You have to be brave as a head teacher. We need, we need head teachers. You know, one, one of the things we're talking about today, um, what we need are brilliant teachers and brilliant head teachers running brilliant schools. The trouble with the command and control culture is it just creates mediocre. And that, that is part of our problem. And where in the world do you work on the basis of finding the things people don't like and making them do more of it? I mean, you know, they're, they're, the clever teacher takes a dance project and the dance project then stimulates drawing and writing and the, the, the music bit I mean you know people tell me these children can't learn and they know the words to every song that you know what Taylor Swift has ever sung I remember I remember when I first started doing inspection work went to school and the head teacher said the the, the remedial groups over there I said what are they doing and we went in the room and they were doing a dance routine, a Britney Spears dance routine, every step of the Britney Spears dance routine. And I said, these don't, don't ever use a term like that for this group of young people because you couldn't do what they've just done. And, you know, I, I think we, we have these strange ideas. And I, I, I'm like, I mean, I think archbishops is, is a great model. I think, you know, Burton Green, Clifton Green, there are little pockets of magic that we need to support and nurture 
Um, and that's where I think having the champions from the cultural creative sector going into schools to say, it's okay to do this and we'll support you doing this. Um, I, I think the opportunities are just fantastic. And I'm going to have to bring this item to close fairly soon. We've got two more questions to, to, to take. One's it Councillor Fisher. This is not really a question. It's an example of how everything that's been said can be put into good practice. In the uh, mid-90s, a new head, head of sixth form took over at Huntington, a guy called Richard Tither. And we'd always done a pantomime, but Richard said, I wanted to do something even better. I want to do a show in a week. And that means taking kids and putting a show on, musical or something like that, and we will do it from Friday at five o'clock and we would put the next show on at Friday at five o'clock and all Saturday. And the head at the time sort of stroked his beard a little bit and said, mm, how many kids are you thinking of? He said, well, about 200, at which point the head stroked his beard a lot more and then said, and how, how much time will they take out lessons? I want them for the whole week. There'll be a whole week off lessons. And the head stroked his beard, but Richard persisted and got the head to agree to it. And he recruited kids from year seven right through to year 13. Some of them were kids who were not academically particularly gifted, but had talents in things like creating costumes, drawing sets and so on. Some were good singers, some were good dancers. And it was fascinating to see these kids that used to come into school at five past nine, always a bit late for registration, or you were always telling off and not handing in the homework, still in school at nine o'clock on Sunday night, rehearsing, preparing, getting things done, and their self-image, because suddenly they were part of a success story. It was phenomenal the way it changed their outlook and attitude to school. And Richard moved on to live in the wilds of Wales about mid-2000s, but the success, his successors who took over from him followed the same routine, kept the tradition going, and it has been a massive success in developing the way kids. And it doesn't show up on Ofsted reports. Ofsted, whoa, no, waste of time. But it shows up in the attitude of the kids and their success in life. And that's really to be commended. I commend you on everything you're doing. I think it's brilliant. Thank you, Councillor Fisher. Councillor Heaton. Yeah, it's, um, it's more of a comment. Um, just to say that I'm delighted that the focus on the uh, mental health and well-being aspect of it as someone who has and does still suffer with uh, depression and anxiety um, these skills that kids are picking up now they are lifelong um, it's something that if you've learned to play an instrument if you've learned to tell stories anything like that at that sort of age you can pick that up if something goes wrong when you're 22 you know you can carry on throughout so it's it's great that there's focus on that I mean, one of the things I remember when we worked together is you told me about the, the thing we ought to celebrate our children. Um, and, you know, I, I think I go round schools and I see their summer performances and their Christmas performances. And there's incredible stuff. And the child who you think and suddenly this voice comes out or that confidence comes out or that or the opportunities come out. It, there, there is so much of that magic in our schools that we, you know, if I, I, you know, my great hope is, you know, 10 years time, perhaps what we have is bits of that come together at the Barbican for a week. And we do that and bits of that end up in the art gallery for a week and bits of it end up at the dance festival a week and bit, you know, that art. I'm just always completely bowled over by what little one and that, that and then being able to say, do you know, you're absolutely brilliant. Their esteem. These people have been told throughout their lives they're rubbish. You know, I can't sing. Or my, one of my music advisors always used to tell me everybody can sing. Yeah. They've just not had very good teachers. Thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you for the report. And thank you, Maxine, for your help and input as well. Um, Thank you. We'll uh, see you again. I'm now going to take um, item eight before item seven, because I know Michael has to, to leave early. So, Michael, the, the hot seat is yours, as it were.
Welcome. Thank you. I've not used one of these before, but that sounds like it's working. Um, thank you all uh, for the invitation to be here. It's very good to sit before you and apologies that Tom Bird, the former CEO of the theatre, was unable to make the meeting in December. Um, I don't propose to go through the report blow by blow. I trust everyone's had a chance uh, to consider it. Um, and in a moment, I, obviously, I'll take questions. I, I just wanted to say um, that it's been a tough couple of years for most arts organisations, as you'll know, um, through the pandemic and through into the recent announcement of the new MPO funding cycle, which has led to um, some theatres uh, closing their doors, notably Oldham Coliseum in an area where there were 100 years ago 100 theatres and now there are none, um, which is extremely sad news. And it's testament, I think, to the team at the theatre um, and the work that's been done over the last few years that we've not only come back from COVID, but our community work is stronger and broader than ever, um, though we still face challenges more generally in terms of audience numbers. Um, but yes, please do ask any questions. Right, thank you, Michael. Any questions from around the, the table in the Theatre Trust report? Talk them down, Michael. <laughs> Never been done before, even by Tom. <laughs> I shall text him and tell him. Um, can I quickly ask? I mean, I, I, I know that obviously this, you'll know this. Uh, committee has a focus on children and young people. Can you tell us a little bit about um, the work you do uh, with that focus on children uh, as a as an important client group? Yeah, and the so, bills on the reach report, which has just, just gone before you. Yeah, I mean, I, I thought um, uh, I thought Chris's uh, testimony was was brilliant, and and I think the work that reach do is phenomenal, and I share. Um, on a personal level, not speaking for the theatre, that Chris's uh, opinion on a lot of matters. Um, and I do think that it's it's vital um, that fun is a key factor in everything children do. Um, I speak as a parent of two, a six-year-old and a three-year-old, um, and they are never more motivated than when they're having a good time. In terms of the work the theatre does, um, one of the key steps we've taken in recent years is to decentralise our youth theatre. So Previously, uh, all of the um, sessions were held on site and now they're held in sites around the city um, as, as detailed in the report. So Drinkhouses, New Earswick and York St. John, um, that's a big step for us. It, it's about the democratisation of culture, that it's not about the big old building in the centre of the city, but rather it's about giving access to young people across the city. And as well as having paid places, we have funded places for that. So there is the opportunity for people of a variety of backgrounds to attend. And of theatres of our scale, we have one of the, um, the most well-attended, if not the most well-attended youth theatres in the country, which is phenomenal. Um, we work with schools uh, across York. So every year, five partner schools with who we endeavour to engage with every pupil within the school um, and via our associate schools programme and in conjunction with the RSC a further 11, 10 of which um, are in York and Brayton is the 11th, which is in Selby. So we have good reach um, through that. And we also run NT Connections, NT being the National Theatre, um, which is... Um, uh, which is uh, nine companies bringing work to a festival uh, later in the year at the theatre. So th there is a broad spectrum. We're eager to uh, diversify further. It's as ever a question of resource and funding. Um, and, you know, we, we want to reach as many um, in line with the, the city strategy. We want to meet, reach as many of the young people in the city as we can. Thank you very much. Councillor Luca. I probably should have declared an interest as I'm a great fan of the, uh, the Theatre Royal. And I am, I must admit, I will give you a plug. I am hugely excited by your summer community production of Sovereign. To have a production of a story that is set around Henry VIII's visit to York in whatever date it was, taking place in the house in which Henry VIII slept, while he was visiting York. It's just mind blowing. I mean, you just sit there and you think, God, what on earth are mm -hmm. we doing? So, I, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's such an opportunity. In a sense, following on a little bit from our um, uh, discussions we've had just had on Reach, um, how 
I, I know the education, the theatre, the theatre's education programme always is a bit of a risky venture because it's, you're having to almost, you know, either self-funded. Are you still getting good take up from children and families to take part in that? We are. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Looker. Um, yeah, we are. And we're, we're getting take up from across the city, uh, which is positive. There are areas where take up is lower. Um, um, and sometimes you can draw, and this is a sweeping statement, but sometimes you can draw um, a relationship between the area cities of, of relatively high deprivation and lower mm. attendance for our educational activities. And that's something we're, we're actively aware of and, and want to address. Mm. Mm. Because there are, I mean, it, it's incredible now, actually, there are such a lot of um, opportunities for I mean, the, the amateur dramatic um, groups in York are, are astounding, mm. quite frankly. Um, have you have you had much involvement or do you have much involvement with places like Theatre 41? Um, because I know they are doing quite a lot of some of that almost, you could say, some of that almost studio work you would mm. be doing. Absolutely. Yes, we do. I think the city's cultural organisations are in a strong place. So you have, um, uh, for us, we're at the centre of a Venn diagram that has cultural institutions as a whole, theatre institutions more generally, uh, and groups who work with children and young people or disadvantaged people. Um, and so we do try and uh, maintain communication with everyone and where possible line up. So, yeah, we, we work um with the team at Monkgate um, and we're in communication with them most of the time. You know, you don't want to end up with everyone delivering the same provision for everyone in the same moment. Uh, and certainly to, to just revert to Sovereign for a moment, um, the Arts Council's 10 year strategy from 2020 to 2030, which is termed Debt's Create, is all about community engagement. And of course, that's a long standing um, area of excellence for the Theatre Royal. But it does run the risk of, of, of generating a moment from the 1st of April as, as the most recent funding cycle begins that everyone tries to engage simultaneously. And, and you have 20 people who are hugely engaged with a lot of different organisations. And there's work going on between um, various groups, including the, the group of York's MPOs, to ensure that the work we're doing to deliver that strategy is lined up and that we are, we're working collaboratively to reach different groups of people so that so that we see the biggest spread of reach that we can. Thank you. That's a web. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for the report, Michael. I think it's, it's really well put together. Um, you've mentioned that you're working with children, adolescent mental health services, and mm. you're running a project with them. I wonder if you could expand on what that involves. Yeah, I mean, that is um, a, a, an embryonic piece of work. So that we're at the beginning of. Um, so uh, some young people from that group are coming this week to see Run Rebel, which is a piece of young adult theatre made by Pilot Theatre, who are York based um, and with whom we have a long standing relationship. Um, and, and we're looking to deliver workshops um, to help support young people with mental health challenges. Um, it's one of those things where what you don't want to do, Councillor Webb, is come and say, this is what we must do because actually you can be too prescriptive in that way. And so we're, we're at the start and we're building that relationship to understand the best fit between what the requirements of the young people are and what we can deliver. So I would hope in future to have more to report on that. Any other questions on the table? Okay, so just got one more to ask you, Michael. Of course. Are there any tickets for Sovereign Left? <laughs> there are a few, but you need to be quick. <laughs> I shall be as quick as I can. Thank you very much. And I know you're busy tonight, so... Um, Thank you very much for coming today and for uh, expanding the report for us, explaining things. Uh, thank you again, and we'll be seeing you very soon in your own committee. Thank you very much. Thank it's you. been a pleasure. I'll see you all soon. Right. Uh, finally, last but not least, in, in a sense, thank you for, for waiting for me. Um, Catherine and Paul. So this is item seven now of uh, the agenda.
that's the right button, jolly good. Um, thank you, councillors, for inviting us to speak this evening. Um, I'm assuming that you've all had an opportunity to read the report. Um, so Paul and I are both very um, happy to answer questions. Um, and I may have to defer to Paul on some things because I'm still just nine weeks into post. So perhaps not as across as much of the detail as Paul is. So thank you. Over to you. So time to ask questions. Um, the Museum's Trust on the report. Any maybe takers? How's a look at? Um, I, I remember that we, there was a lot of disappointment in um, not getting the uh, capital funding for the transformation. Is there any development on that or have you just had to put it in total cold storage for the time being? Um, thank you, Councillor Looker. I think given when the news came through and the period that we've all lived through, the, the focus has been absolutely on just the survival of the I trust. Mm -hmm. um, so we are very much thinking about what we can do on that site, but I think we're also um, acutely mindful of the very difficult funding landscape that we all live in now, and that a project that um, came in a, a bill of nearly £76 million is very unlikely to secure that level of funding. So we're working closely with colleagues in CYC to look at how we might um, revisit that and produce uh, um, options that might be either staged or more easy to secure funding for in, in chunks, if that makes sense. Oh, and secondly, a totally different subject. And um, I've read with very great interest, um, and I know you're not the Tate Gallery, um, but they're um, taking, in a sense, taking the gallery out rather than expecting you to, um, to people to, to come to you. And I just wondered, I mean, it would have to be on a much more modest scale, but you have got some incredible stuff stashed away in your stores haven't you that nobody ever gets to see or hardly ever and I wondered if there were some opportunities looking particularly at the report we've had and discussed it from reach around how to in a sense take the museum out of its um, out of its environs and, and give it give it space somewhere else Thank, thank you. Another really interesting question and one that we talk about. Um, and obviously, first and foremost, we need to make sure that we're caring for the objects that we are uh, responsible for on behalf of the city properly and appropriately. But yes, once we've overcome that hurdle, you're absolutely right. So two things that we're doing at the moment were speaking with the University of York about how we might work with them in the work that they're doing in their Westfield Centre, currently in Acom. We're also talking with York Explorer about how we might make use of the facilities they have around the city as well. But during COVID, as is well documented in the paper, our, 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 our headcount shrank considerably. Um, and that's one area of the organisation that we're just looking to rebuild at the minute, particularly around our learning and our outreach and our community engagement staff. So that would be an area that we'd really look to explore. So thank you for the prompt. Well, I remember visiting the Yorkshire Museum where you were having a hands-on session where people could handle, I mean, museums are full of don't touch. And this was, I mean, you had dinosaur bones, all sorts of fascinating things, which people could just handle and peer at and look at and they didn't have to wear gloves or anything. Um, so I know it is a very real, exciting experience for people to, to feel they're holding something Absolutely. And that programme was run previously by volunteers and also during COVID, our volunteering programme folded in on itself. And we're just beginning to revitalise that again. But you're absolutely right. There are elements of our collection that, that need to be held, really, to be understood, um, particularly in some of our um, natural sciences collections um, and also in terms of some of our social history collections. So, yes, thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Councillor Fisher. Thank you very much indeed. Very interesting report. Um, Looking at your uh, paragraph, uh, page 45, about the decision to reopen the art gallery with uh, no charging, clearly that has been very successful in um, restoring visitor numbers. It's the obviously the one that has come back best after the COVID uh, disaster. Um, on the other hand, it, we also see it's costing you 200k in lost income. Have you come to a conclusion as to whether you can continue to sustain free entry to the art gallery or is it something you're going to have to look to restore charges? Because clearly there's 
it's very important to get people through the gallery, but it's also important to get them spending money while they're there so that, you know, it can be sustained. Thank you. Uh, again, really um, helpful question for us to explore with you. Um, and one that we've been talking about this afternoon, actually, back at the museum with, with some of our trustee colleagues. Um, clearly, we would wish that all the museums didn't have to have a charge against them. That, that would be, I think, all of our preference in the room. Uh, that's not the cultural landscape that this country occupies, nor is likely to uh, in the immediate future. So let's be pragmatic about it. Um, we haven't come to a conclusion on it at the moment. We're still doing the work to think about whether that £200,000 is something that we can justify on an ongoing basis or whether there are other ways that we can bring that, that revenue back into the organisation. Um, certainly what, what you don't see here um, is the detail that sits under, under underneath that in terms of how visitor numbers are made up, where those visitor numbers are drawn from, where people are coming, whether it's the same people coming more often or whether it is has actually broadened and we're still doing the detail on that um, and also as is often the case when it's free of charge at a cultural institution that the spend per head in the secondary concession areas so the shop the cafe for instance goes down because people feel less inclined to spend that time there because the dwell time also usually goes down because people can come more often um, and, and there are huge reports um, done on that based on the work that happened in the national museums when they went free of charge in the late 1990s so while we would very much wish to keep it open we're still doing the work to understand how we would make that happen obviously not open free i should say very clearly free not open anything else paul on that one okay thank you chair um yeah i think i think i i just echo the after everything we've talked about tonight having free open public spaces that we can explore our history and our culture is is so important and something that we should do everything we can to to keep um but i understand and i thought that was a very nice way of putting it not the cultural landscape that britain occupies at the moment that was a very good phrase um following on from that theme on uh, the first page of the report you've got your current priorities uh, for 2022-23. The fourth one there is increase our resilience by expanding enterprises and fundraising activities, investing in our people and caring for our environment. Could you sort of expand a little bit on, on what that means? Uh, yeah, of course. Um, in terms of... Uh, Enterprises, um, which is the first of those, that is about um, uh, we 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 have a, a you know um, a good retail offer. Well, we can have a better retail offer, a more focused retail offer, um, and we bought some uh, people with some different experience in. And they're already having an impact on improving um, sales and uh, and therefore, if you like, profit, um, making the venues that we have at our disposal um, attractive and used by not just the brilliant hospitium for weddings um, sort of venue, which is quite rightly retained its sort of popularity um but also as a venue for conferencing um for corporates and others to use because we've got some fairly you know kind of um offbeat types of offers kirkgate or or the hospitium to host these things that you know hotels and what have you don't have they're boring aren't they um so uh you know there are ways of us making money um sweating the assets harder particularly probably in the gardens longer term you know that's a lovely space um we can keep the loveliness and our sort of you know make some attractive things in there that people want to enjoy experience and pay for um fundraising activities um looking at our patron schemes our supporters schemes uh 
because you know we can we can do a lot better than we've done so far um investing in our people you know it goes without saying i'm, I'm sure you all buy into it making sure our people have the skills and capabilities not just to do the jobs that they're doing today but the jobs that we require we will require them to do tomorrow so they're coming up with brilliant ideas uh, and they feel empowered and enabled to you know bring those to life and bring them into practice because that's where our um you know future will come from and and um came for an environment like everybody everybody else it's certainly uh the state of your gas and electricity bills makes you immediately go into the well what can we do what could we do on the roofs of our museums what could we do uh if we're taught you know we talked earlier about the replacing you, you know assets and uh, needing to do some fairly fundamental works on places like the castle museum but also everywhere else always needs renewing how will we do that with heat pumps or solar or wind or whatever um how do we make sure our staff um all understand the impact that climate has and we've got some fantastic uh collections and resources that we can use in the gardens and the Yorkshire museum in particular you know the natural uh, natural history stuff to sort of bring some of that caring for the environment to life so th those are some things we're doing and some things we have in the 23-24 plan to do as well Thank you, Paul. I, I note on the page 46 um, that um, certainly visitor numbers uh, from 2019, 2020 to the projected numbers today, they've actually recovered quite well, haven't they? And yet, of course, you're under the same financial pressures we're all familiar with in, in both the council, but also in our home environments. Um, is there anything that we could do as a committee to, to alleviate the, the pressures you have uh, on the forthcoming year's budget. Thank you. That's a really helpful question. I think there are a couple of things that's probably useful for you to be aware of and one that probably scrutiny committee might wish to consider. I think we're working really hard across the city, as you've heard from um, our colleagues in the, in the wider cultural sector today, to make sure that we share information, that we don't try and cannibalise audiences, that we let work collaboratively. Um, and, and support resourcing the city as a place for young people to thrive and to access culture for people who come to the city to enjoy what we have to offer here. Um, and also so that we're able to develop and support a cohort of creative, talented people who can go on to work in all of our institutions and, and perhaps beyond. Um, I think the complexity that you've seen in our paper um, is that we are the custodians not just of the city's collections but also of some of the finest listed buildings in the city and there are very many listed buildings in this city and the complexity of managing that estate in a way that's fit for purpose for the 21st century both from an accessibility point as we heard um, the member of the public say earlier in the meeting but also in terms of a carbon neutral, neutral future is very difficult um, and as we move back to heading towards to 100% of where we were pre-COVID, um, we're not left with much in our tank in terms of reserves. Mm. So the letter of comfort that CYC have provided for the last couple of years has, has brought um, a lifeline for us, really. So I think anything that could be done to extend that would, would make our future feel much more comfortable um, across 23, 24, 24 and 25. So I think that would that would be enormously helpful if that could be considered. Thank you. Okay. Uh, obviously, I could write as chair, um, perhaps with the uh, involvement of our uh, vice chair, Councillor Webb, um, to uh, ask the uh, executive member responsible for culture to consider favourably such a letter and uh, um, provide support to what is obviously recognised as being a very valuable city institution of museums across the city and uh, provide a whole host of cultural opportunities for our local people, as well as our visitors, of course. So I think uh, Councillor Webb's agreement, we will 
um, see what we can do to... I'm slightly concerned as to what sort of check you're writing for the next administration, <laughs> if I'm honest, Councillor Daubney. <laughs> um, but uh, it's certainly something that... It's uh, something which has been ongoing since, was it 2019? 2020. It was first raised in March 2020 when COVID hit and we had a... Um, you know, potential crisis of funding. Yeah. So, okay. uh, so uh, that early part of 2020. Right. Well, thank you very much for that. Okay. Thank you. Any, th any other questions around the table? There's a fisher. No, sorry. No, no, finger raised. I thought you meant you had a question. Right. Well, thank you both for the report. And uh, I think that brings us to a close. I have no urgent business, but I should like to thank. Um, all the members of the committee, um, our uh, democracy officer, Jane Muller, and our unseen technical staff for uh, their services uh, during the uh, four years of this, uh, of this committee this, this full year.